Let's clear a little space in case there's some enthusiastic arm waving or some of the exuberant <laughs> activity at the beginning and I'm going knocking things flying all over the place. Good morning everybody, it's nice, morning, to, see morning. You. nice to see you all here um, this morning. Um, that passage um, that uh, Caroline just read to us in 2 Corinthians creates for us this role uh, of an ambassador for Christ. Now if you look across the New Testament particularly, you'll see lots of different patterns about how uh, people, uh, disciples and followers of Christ behaved um, and how Christ himself um, uh, behaved as well. So, for example, Jesus did lots of things. Sometimes he went to a synagogue and, and spoke there. Sometimes he sp went to an individual and spoke to them. Sometimes he went on a hillside and he spoke to, I don't know, thousands of people. Um, he fed, he fed 5,000, for example. So the crowds that, that he spoke to were quite big. A whole range of different ways of talking and sharing the good news of the kingdom. And on the day of Pentecost, of course, we see the disciples not stuck in the upper room, but rather out on the streets. And it was out on the streets that Peter pre preaches that tremendous uh, Pentecost Day sermon. And it says 3,000 people came to believe in Jesus Christ and gave their lives to, to, to him that day. And of course, if we go on through the Acts of the Apostles, we see how very often they went out on missionary journeys. Paul went out on missionary journeys. Sometimes he was on his own, sometimes he went with somebody else as a pair. And we see Jesus, if you remember, sent out some of his disciples um, in pairs uh, in order to go into towns um, and to be out on the road somewhere preaching the gospel. Very seldom do you get the impression that the message giving about Christ was done inside of four walls. Occasionally Jesus goes to a synagogue for sure, but outside of that, until the church is established over the centuries, very much the activity of the church is outside. It's in the streets, it's in the homes, it's where people are and live and work. And in a sense, I think sometimes as church today, we've lost that sense of where we are to be ambassadors for Christ. It says in uh, verse 20, we are, uh, we are ambassadors. And the bit that always gets me when I read that verse is this bit. It says, God making his appeal through us. So just, just dwell on that a minute and think about it. God wants to make God, him upstairs who created the universe and put the stars in place, who is beyond our imagination and understanding, he wants to make his appeal through you. I think that's a challenge for us, isn't it? We're empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's not in our strength that we speak, but it's in the power of the Spirit that flows through us. But we are the vessels of that message today as ambassadors for Christ. So I want to give you four things to think about in relation to being an ambassador. Uh, the first is this. Um, you have to accept the role. Now, what exactly is an ambassador? Well, an ambassador in a, in a political sense is somebody who is appointed to represent their country in a foreign land. So, um, you know, we have in this country um, an American ambassador who lives in this giant house with massive gardens, supposedly the biggest garden in London. And we have people who equally live in Washington representing the UK and around countries all over the world. The exchange being representing the interests of our country uh, in another land. And I think we have to remind ourselves, and I know I bang on about this quite a lot, but we, there, are two, there are two worlds. If you go back to Genesis, you find the perfection of God's creation and the, and the, the sin of man that separates man from God. So if God doesn't move and doesn't go anywhere, that means that there is a secondary existence alongside. It's called the fallen world. It's where God in this sinful nature resides. It's where we live. It's where the forces of evil, where the devil resides and, 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 uh, um, and operates. And you have these two separate entities. You have the presence of God, the kingdom of God, the glory of God, and you have the fallen world. And we are in the fallen world representing the interests of the kingdom of God. And that's why we're ambassador. We're not representing the world and what it thinks. We're representing God and what he thinks and how he wants to show his love to the world. 
And the other thing to say about being an ambassador for Christ um, is that it's not part-time. So the first question is, are you happy to be an ambassador for Christ? You may not be happy, but are you willing? <laughs> Maybe that's a better way of phrasing it. Are you willing to be an ambassador for Christ? Wherever you go, whatever you do, whoever you're with, representing the interests of the kingdom of God, of God himself, as he makes his appeal through you. So first of all, it's about your acceptance and your willingness and your acknowledgement that that's your calling and your role. The second thing is to know what your message is. You remember last time, I say last time, a, a few times ago, we, um, I shared with you from my own uh, uh, experience of the Billy Graham crusade that something called the four spiritual laws. You remember the four spiritual laws when we shared those together? You're either all asleep or none of you can remember. I'm not quite sure which it is, but anyway, just remember the four spiritual laws were, if you like, just a summary of a very short summary of the gospel message. One, God loves you. Law number one, God loves you and has a plan for your life. Spiritual law number two, the sin and selfishness of you and mankind and, and human beings in general cannot exist in the presence of God and so it separates us from God's love. That's what we were talking about a minute ago, the two kingdoms. The third spiritual law was that Jesus, because God loves us and has a plan for us, part of that love reaches out to us in Jesus on the cross as he paid the penalty for our sin and offers us the route to salvation through forgiveness of our sins and resurrection to eternal life. And the fourth spiritual law is that in order to access that forgiveness and the promise of eternal life, we have to receive Jesus Christ as part of our lives, as our Lord and Saviour. We have to don the hat of the ambassador for God himself, sharing the love of Jesus that we experience in our forgiveness with others. So we have to accept our role. Secondly, we have to understand what our message is and the message that we are offering to other people. The third thing I'd like to say to you is that we do it in a non-judgmental way. We live in a society that sadly is losing its ability to forgive others. When somebody does something wrong, they're immediately judged and condemned and asked to resign, sack them, get rid of them, whatever. You see it all the time across society. I'll give you an example. Just the other day, there was the vicar who uh, uh, gave a, a bereft mourner at the funeral of her husband a hug. She was, she was breaking down in tears and he put his arm around her to console her. He was reported for breaking COVID rules and is now likely to lose his job. It shows you the madness of our world. But as Christians, we have to be careful not to adopt that same madness. You may agree with somebody or you may disagree with them. It's not your role to judge. Jesus said, I came to the world not to judge it, but to save it. When the woman was caught in adultery, he turned to the crowd and said, whichever one of you has no sin whatsoever, you can be the judge and throw the first stone. Nobody threw the stone, so Jesus says to the woman, neither do I judge you, go and sin no more. The world is full of judgment and we have to be careful not to be on that bandwagon. We may meet somebody that we don't agree with. We may not like them. We may disagree with their philosophy, their sexuality, their position in life, the way they dress, everything about them we may disagree with, but we are still called to love them, not to judge them. And if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' teaching of how the Christian life should be lived, you see it. Love your enemies, forgive those who persecute you, do not judge others. Take the plank out of your own, own eye before you take a speck out of someone else's. If someone asks for your shirt, give them your coat as well. If someone asks you to go one mile, go two miles. It's a challenge of service, not of judgment, but of willingness to sacrifice and lay down our own lives for others. And when we're called to be ambassadors for Christ, that's the attitude that we should have in our judgmental world. Not judging people but loving them 
and laying down our lives for them. Judgment is not our role, that's God's. We are here to serve and to save the lost. And the fourth thing I'd like to say about being an ambassador is that you will face opposition. My own personal view is that the church in this country is going to meet opposition over the coming decades in a way that it hasn't done, probably in history of, of this country at least. Our society, um, partly because of um, partly because of the way that it is becoming, has become very judgmental, and it will become judgmental of the church because many of the things that we believe are going to be different from the things that the world wants us to believe. You see, the thing about the two kingdoms is that one is God's holiness and righteousness, and the other is the fallen world of man's selfishness and the devil's activity. And the two are nine times out of ten polar opposites. The world judges other people, we are to forgive them and to lay our lives down for them. An example of those polar opposites. So when we stand, we will face opposition. Jesus faced opposition during his life. He faced it not only from the, the church, uh, the, 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 the synagogue and the religious authorities, but from other people and, of course, from the activity of the devil. Several times in the, in the story of the Gospels, you see the devil for, uh, um, at play in opposition to what Jesus was doing. And we have to remind ourselves that that's true for us. It's not just human beings, but we're also in a spiritual battle because the force of evil in the world is something that we have to face and overcome. And we have the power and the victory in Jesus Christ to do just that. So give me, I'll just try and give you some, some examples. Today, the world is very identity conscious. Increasingly, we label people by their identity. You're black, you're white, you're transgender, you're gay, you're heterosexual, you're non-binary, you're whatever it is. The opposite of that that the Bible talks about is that we are all the same. We are all made in the image of God. We are all made in the image of God. And when we give our lives to Christ, we become children of God. We're all part of the same family. We are equally children together. So the only difference in identity that I can see as a Christian is someone who is saved and someone who isn't. The rest of it is irrelevant. And we have to be careful that when we express something like that, we will face opposition. People will shout at us and condemn us and judge us for not agreeing with their view of life. Sexuality is another one. The gay, lesbian, heterosexual, trans, all that sort of stuff. Again, people are labelled and stand up for their rights, their particular, their particular box that they're in. Let me tell you, my view of it is that the Bible condemns all sexual activity outside of marriage. So if I look at the world today, that's not just homosexual activity, that's 80% of the, of, of the population heterosexual are probably caught by that condemnation and judgment as well. For me, it's not about the type of sexual activity, it's about the fact that it's done outside of marriage, because that is the unit that God creates in Genesis. If you go back to that, you'll see that that's what he creates, a man and a woman combined together. And that message is repeated throughout the New Testament. But people will absolutely hate us for giving that message. I'll tell you now, they will absolutely hate you if you stand up and give that, that, that Christian view. You can see it already in the debates that are happening across society and how some churches are really struggling and becoming quite divided by it. So we haven't got time to go into it today. We did have a uh, a Zoom uh, conversation about this um, a couple of months ago, um, uh, only one or two people joined it. Um, if people want to revisit that subject, then perhaps we can have another one. You'll have to let us know. Um, and money is another thing. So at the moment, there's a big debate about should the NHS have a 3% pay rise or do they deserve more? And then the police come out because they've got a pay freeze. And they say, absolutely, we're, you know, it's the last straw, it's an insult. We're not getting any pay rise whatsoever. My question is this, how can I 
campaign for a pay rise for me when I am in the top five or six percent of the world's wealthiest people? How can I justify a pay rise and more money for myself when it, if I was living in Madagascar today, I would be on the edge of starvation? Five years of drought, all total crop failure, and the country is on the brink of collapse. If I was living in Lebanon, the economy has collapsed. Water supplies have virtually run out, and the country, again, is about to implode. People on the edge of starvation. If I go to virtually everywhere else in the world, there's a story to tell of people who are suffering from the lack of basics in life. I'm not talking about luxuries. I'm talking about water and food and a roof over their heads. So I ask myself as I stand before my God, how can I campaign for 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5% when actually I'm already in the richest quartile of the world's population? For me, that's not a message which will go down well in British society. If I was to say, don't give the NHS any pay rise at all, I would probably get lynched, <laughs> wouldn't I? Probably. But actually, I have sympathy with the argument that they should have a pay rise. But if I actually step back and look at the world in the round, I struggle with that sympathy that I have. It's a moral dilemma for us. But well, the point I'm making is this, is that when we stand on the true truth of the gospel, we will often get into these situations where we are in conflict with our society and the way it thinks and acts. And as a result of that, when we stand for God, and what, is, what did um, uh, Corinthians say? God making his appeal through us. So if we believe in the teaching of the Bible, God is not going to change that for the convenience of our society. Is he? No. If that's the case, then we have to stand by the truth that we see. And we have to understand what that means for us as ambassadors for Christ. And we have to stand on that truth and it will lead to opposition to our message. And if you think that that's not likely, then let me give you two more quick examples. There was a private school in England somewhere, I can't remember where it was now. And the Anglican chaplain told the pupils um, in one of his sessions that when it came to the issues of sexuality, they should look at all the options, understand all the arguments and make up their own mind. When the school found out about that, that was all he said, by the way, he didn't, he didn't argue for or against anything. When the school found out about that, they sacked him instantly. The governors reinstated him on appeal, but they imposed not only a final letter of warning, but that every teaching session, every sermon, every message that he gave into the school in his role as chaplain had to be written in advance and cleared by the headmistress before he was allowed to just read it. I'll leave you to form your own judgment as to the rights or wrong of that, but that's what's just happened. If you go to Portland in Oregon, Portland in Oregon has been one of the cities quite uh, uh, most affected in the US by the Black Lives Matters movement. When that happened 12, 15 months ago, whenever it, whenever it blew up, uh, many of the hard left communist um, anarchist kind of wing of society, they created um, an aut what's called, uh, called an <coughs> autonomous zone. It's about two square miles and they just arbitrarily put up barricades around it and they banned the police from it because of course they're that one of, their, one of their, their motives was to defund the police and to take the police force away. Um, and they've been there ever since. And most weeks they go out and following their agenda of breaking down capitalism and destroying uh, the priv uh, white privilege and all the other things that go with it, um, they attack properties, they loot. Um, their philosophy is that looting is a justifiable and perfectly acceptable and normal means of political um, uh, expression. What they have now turned their, identity, uh, their, their attack to is churches. And in Portland over the last couple of months there have been several attacks where that group have gone directly at the church to burn down premises and to attack the leaders of the churches or at, at their homes simply because they are standing up for something that they regard as, well, they regard as the white God that rules the US society. 
Now, I'm not going to pass judgment on them because I'm not allowed to. God has told me I can't judge them. But I'm going to disagree with them. But actually, I have to go to... Theoretically, I have to go to Portland and I have to reach out and serve them, take them food, help them in whatever way I can, because that's the calling on me. But the opposition there against the church is starting to emerge in this country uh, and in that country. And in Canada, you may have seen the stories of the burning of churches across Canada. Several were burnt down over the last month. It's beginning to rise up in Western democracies. Now, I don't know where it will all go. All I'm saying is this is that if you're going to be an ambassador for Christ, you have to stand on the truth. That truth will sometimes put you in opposition with the society of which you are, the earthly society of which you are part. It doesn't put you in opposition with God's society, with the kingdom of God, because he is making his appeal through you. So the challenge is this, how much does God mean to you? How much does Jesus mean to you? Are you called, do you feel that call to be his voice, God's voice in your community and in your workplace, in your society? Are you happy to don the ambassador's hat? Are you willing to stand up and proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ died for the world? Are you willing and ready to lay your life down in service? Are you able to stand and face any opposition that comes in your way? God loves you, but he's called you to help him in the task of salvation for the people of this world. God calls you to be an ambassador for Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, I just pray for each one of us in this room this morning that you lay on us now the assurance of our salvation in you. May we know 120%, Lord, that we are saved because of your love for us and our acceptance of your spirit into our lives. Just assure us of that salvation as we bow before you, Lord. And Lord, I pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to fill us again and afresh, to renew our spiritual energy for you. And I pray, Lord, that you open the doors in society that we may be able to speak of you to others, that we may be able to serve others in love and go the extra mile for them, that we may shine like a light of hope in the darkness of despair in other people's lives. Lord, we pray for our families. We pray for our neighbours. We pray for our work colleagues. We pray for our, our country, our town. Lord, have mercy upon us. May your spirit flood this nation and win it back for your name. Lord, send revival that we may be empowered to be ambassadors for you. And we say to you this morning, Lord, here we are. Make your appeal through us. In Jesus' name. Amen.